In the name of the Creator, Redeemer and Sanctifier. Amen. Please be seated. The Sunday school teacher was describing that when Lot's wife looked back at Sodom, she turned into a pillar of salt. Then Bobby interrupted. My mummy looked back once when she was driving, he announced, and she turned into a telephone pole. What more can we say about the parable of the Good Samaritan that you probably haven't heard already? Most of you who have been coming to church for a long time will have heard this parable at least every three years. You'll have heard many sermons on it. And I wonder if there's anything new I could bring to it. And my hunch is probably not. This one begins with a question that's not altogether unexpected. What must I do to inherit eternal life? In the Gospels, there's two sorts of questions that Jesus gets asked. There's the questions asked by the Pharisees and the Sadducees that are designed to trap him or trip him up. Let's get some dirt on Jesus. Let's get him to say something controversial or something that would be considered heresy and then we've got him. There's those sorts of questions. This one, even though we're told it's a question to test him, is not seeming to be one of those types of questions. This seems to be a genuine question asked from someone who wants an actual answer. The bit to say this was to test Jesus was that was a common thing that people did to rabbis. I want to ask you a question. And they'd pose a simple ethical question or conundrum and the rabbi would have to answer it. That seems to be what's happening here. Jesus is asked a genuine question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives a genuine answer. However, he gives a difficult answer. There's no doubt about it. There is little about Jesus' answer that's easy to handle when we consider it in the context of its day. What's in the law, says Jesus? Good teacher that respond to a question with a question. Well, the two great commandments, says the lawyer. Good, says Jesus. Good answer. Go and do that and live. Ah, but who is my neighbour, says the lawyer. And Jesus, instead of just telling him the simple response, everybody, tells a story. And what a story it is. If there's anything that's designed to shock and confront people in today's gospel passage, it's this story. Remember, this is just a story. It's a parable. It's not an event that actually happened. It's just a story designed to illustrate a point about God. There was, a, there was a bit of history that a long time ago a traveller, an early tourist to the Holy Land, wanted to see the sights of Jesus' life and death. He wanted to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, the tomb where Jesus was laid, the shore of Lake Galilee where he taught. He wanted to go and visit towns like Bethany and Jerusalem and Jericho. And then he asked the tour guide, I want to see the inn on the road to Jericho where the Samaritan took the man who was injured. Well, it's just a story. There is no inn. Well, that's the true answer. But this enterprising tour guide had someone build an inn to show this tourist. There you go. There's the inn. It's not a real inn. It is now, but it wasn't there when the story happened. This is just a story. But it's a story with some real truth behind it that packs an incredible punch. A man is beset by robbers and he's left for dead. And three people come along to help him. Three people who approach him in order of rank, if you want to say. In this society, the priest is the most important. It's one of the indications we have that we have lost connection with that community, with that society. Priests are the least important nowadays. Come on, you're all meant to go, oh. <laughs> 
So the priest comes along to help. And what help does he offer? Nothing. He looks at the man, sees that he's half dead, and turns across to the other side of the road. That may be a very good reason for him not to help. For in those days, for a priest to touch a man who was bleeding or half dead, or maybe he thought he was dead, would have rendered the priest ritually unclean and unable to perform his duties. Might be a good reason not to help him, or might not. The next comes the Levite, and he too, like the priest, sees the man and decides his ritual purity is more important than helping this man who's been uh, injured and left for dead. And then comes the Samaritan. In our hierarchy of three, he is the least. And this is the shock for Jesus' hearers. The Samaritan is the enemy, the absolute enemy. And he is the one who helps. When I say enemy, I don't mean that the Samaritan is like, you know, a Queenslander to you New South Welshmen. I'm not talking about a friendly rivalry between the Samaritans and the Jews. You know, ultimately they like each other, but they'll rib each other and give each other curry as much as they can. You know, you Queenslanders can't merge. You know, you New South Welshmen can't handle a roundabout. You know, it's not that sort of rivalry where we don't take it really seriously, except at state of origin time. It's not that kind of hatred. This is, you are the enemy. You are the one we hate. We don't want to mix with you. This is serious hatred. To claim a Samaritan is a neighbour that we should love or that would stoop to help a Jew on the road that's beaten up and left for dead on the road is absolutely scandalous in a way that sometimes I feel we've lost touch with how scandalous it is. The best illustrations I can think of my own life where I've encountered this, the sort of scandalous reaction that the hearers of this parable would have had. In 2002, I taught an RE class, and it was the very beginning of the year, because we all know what happened in September 11, 2001. I taught an RE class and I retold the parable. The parable of the Good Samaritan was the parable for the day in the RE class. So I retold it in modern times. And the Samaritan I replaced with the Muslim. Grade four students got it. As soon as I said that word, they all went, (gasps) you could hear it in a class of 20 kids, all of them with the intake of breath. How shocking it would be. I thought that their reaction was so on point for this parable that that Sunday I decided to tell it uh, in the same way to the congregation. And what happened? I had someone get up and walk out of church. I had someone else tell me afterwards, pull me aside and tell me, you are absolutely wrong, Christian. They would never do that. That sense of shock, which we don't share as much now, that sense of shock was as close as I can imagine to what the shock is of the questioner. And I'm sure in 1945, if we'd have told the story of, but replaced it with a Japanese person, the same shock would have been, would have been in us. or a German. And Jesus says says to this lawyer, go and do like your enemy, because he was the one that was the neighbour. See, how do we appropriate this today? Because this is an odd parable. It's a very odd parable. Think about who the group is today, that if we retold this story today, 
who would we substitute for the Samaritan that would cause you to go, no, not that person. They wouldn't do that. Think of who that is for you today and hear that Jesus is saying to you, go and do likewise. Who's that current enemy or that outcast person that we simply struggle to envisage being someone who would help out? But it's not just about working out who they might be. This last statement of Jesus, go and do likewise, makes this the most unusual parable. Go and do likewise. A direct command to be like one of the characters in the parable it doesn't happen in any other parable. In every other parable, we're left to simply reflect on and think about what the kingdom of God is, what forgiveness is, what love is, what grace is. But in this one, we're told, go and be like that character. Go and love like the Samaritan loves. It's love when it costs you. He stopped and paid for the treatment of this enemy. It cost him money. Love when it's not expected. He was the Samaritan. He wasn't meant to help. Love beyond what others think is reasonable. When he drops him off at the inn, what does he do? You look after him, and when I come back, I'll pay whatever extra it costs to settle his accounts. Surely just getting him into the inn we would have thought, well, that's enough. Someone else can look after him now. But I'll go the extra mile. I cannot think of any other parable that has at the end of it a statement that says to us, go and do. How serious does Jesus take the idea for us of loving our neighbour? He thinks it's so serious that he breaks his own patterns of parables. He thinks it's so serious that he commands us to follow the example of a fictional, hated enemy. He calls us to love when it costs, to love when it's unexpected, to love when others tell us, just stop. And he tells us to go and do likewise. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.